So I think we can we can slowly start, and whoever joins will hopefully join uh, later. Uh, I would like to greet you all. Uh, this is the uh, launch of the new issue of the Hungarian Historical Review, a thematic issue called Holocaust Victimhood in Hungary, New Histories, and it just came out. My name is Balázs Trencsény, I'm representing the History Department of CU and also Democracy Institute and also PASS Incorporated, and it's a coalition of, this event is a coalition of a number of uh, institutions being involved. One is PASS Incorporated, the other one is CU Department of Gender Studies, and uh, also the working group of democracy in history of the new CU Democracy Institute and uh, last but not least, the subcommittee of the history of Second World War of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Uh, so we have a number of uh, very uh, different, but in some ways converging institutional involvement uh, in this. And I, I think it's, it's important that this takes place. And I hope that it will be interesting for everybody who is involved here. Uh, I would like to mention two uh, technical details. One is that there is a recording you can see. So whoever doesn't want to feature with face, you can switch off the camera. But I hope it, it is not a problem to be recorded. And the other thing is that, uh, that uh, we agreed that the uh, logic of uh, the discussion is better if, uh, if there is a chat uh, uh, basically function which you can use. So uh, I think Andrea will uh, silence everybody uh, or the host will silence everybody and, and you can send questions in with chat and then uh, then we will try to mo moderate and also the people whom, to whom the questions are, uh, are uh, raised will, will also have a chance to answer. Uh, the, the framework of the discussion will, will be partially uh, a kind of general overview or introduction to the issue by Kata Bohus, uh, who is uh, now at the University of Tromsø, but also CU alumna. And, uh, and I think she has been working on these issues uh, quite a long time. So she has many perspectives on, on this, I am sure. And then we will listen to some of the uh, participants who could make it. Uh, Helena Huhak, uh, Pál István Ádám, Borbála Klacsman, Alexandra Szabó, and András Széchenyi. And uh, then there will be also a very short uh, uh, kind of overview of the papers of those who couldn't be here, uh, uh, Ferry Lazzo and Tamás uh, Csapodi. Uh, and uh, edit uh, Jegesh, I think. I, I hope I mentioned everybody. And then we, we can have a, a discussion uh, and, and I hope that there will be critical and, uh, and uh, complex uh, uh, remarks and discussion from, from the audience as well. Uh, so I think we, I will now uh, pass the word first uh, to, to Kata and once again, uh, welcome to all of you. And uh, of course, we are all totally fed up with Zoom discussions by now, and we would like to see each other live and not just in these kind of small boxes, but it's still a, a good opportunity to, to listen to each other and to share ideas. And, and it's also, I think, an opportunity to bring people together who are in different places. So I hope that it will be a meaningful event for all of us. So the floor is yours, Kata, and, and then we will go ahead with uh, the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Balash, for your introduction. And as you said, it's, it's yeah, everybody has enough of Zoom. I, I actually had a three day long tinnitus last week, and I would love to return to see you not only virtually, but better than nothing, I guess. Uh, so I would like also uh, to welcome everybody, the contributors, the editors, uh, and everybody who is taking the time to listen in. So I would like to start with that pretty bold statement, which is there is worldwide interest in Holocaust victimhood in Hungary. I know that you might immediately accuse me of irresponsibly making unsupported and bombastic statements, but hear me out uh, as I present two recent examples. In 2019, Israel's annual Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Day was accompanied by a social media project on Instagram called Eva Stories. 
It was based on the story of Eva Heyman, a Hungarian Holocaust victim from Oradea, Nagyvara. Um, it was a, uh, in a 24 hour period, a dramatized version of Eva's life was posted on Instagram in the form of a series of short video posts created with the social media site's story function. The episodes were filmed as if Eva Heyman was documenting her life with a smartphone and uploading the videos onto Instagram herself. The story was based on the book Eva's mother published in 1947 entitled Eva Lanyom Naplo, My Daughter Eva Diary, which was subsequently translated into several languages. And the diary, which is written in first person, is an account of the war's effect of a Jewish teenager's life and about the relationships between people in her family. Though both the source, the diary, and the format of this endeavor, a social media campaign, raise serious issues, I think, there is no question that it was really successful. Celebrities such as Wonder Woman actress Gal Gadot and the American comedian Sarah Silverman urged people to follow Eva's story, as did Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Right after the first post, Eva's stories reached 200,000 followers, and by the end of the campaign, 10, 24 hours later, this number climbed to 1.7 million. The other event happened, happened about a month ago, um, I think, when the sensational news that Pope Francis paid a surprise visit to Hungarian Holocaust survivor Edith Brook in her home in Rome spread around in international media like wildfire. Apparently, having read a recent interview with Brook, the Pope was very moved. I have come here to thank you for your testimony and to pay homage to the people martyred by the insanity of Nazi populism, he told Brook. I think that these two examples highlight that the victims' personal stories, such as these, have a very strong effect on those who hear them, and that interest in the history of the Hungarian Holocaust is real, and that Holocaust research is as important as ever, being not only a scientific, but a moral and ethical imperative. The special issue of the Hungarian Historical Review of Holocaust Victimhood on Holocaust Victimhood responds to such interest and need. But perhaps it is worth noting the precedence of this publication as we consider the past and present of Holocaust research in Hungary and internationally as well. The special issue is the product of an effort that started well over a decade ago to make Holocaust research that is done by Hungarian researchers using innovative research methods internationally accessible. In the introduction, Editors Andra Pető, Alexandra Sabo, and Andra Stéchén refer to a heated debate among Holocaust historians back in 2008, which was sparked by an article that CU professor Gábor Gyáni published in the journal Fomenta. In his piece, Gyáni argued that Holocaust research in Hungary was suffering from methodological weaknesses and that Hungarian Holocaust historians were not part of ongoing international discussions of the subject. Some of the methodological problems that Yanni brought up were by not any means unique to Hungary. For example, international Holocaust research had also mostly focused on the perpetrators, in as much as more often than not, it analyzed organizations and networks of persecution. It tended to overlook the victims who appeared as objects of persecution to whom the Holocaust happened, and they were presented as helpless non-actors who, to use the biblical image first evoked in this context by poet and wartime partisan leader Abba Kovner, went like sheep to the slaughterhouse. In that way, researchers had until that point presented a very complex event from a limited perspective. Another critique that was voiced concerned the way Hungarian Holocaust historians approached their subject that the histories produced were overwhelmingly descriptive, consisting of the presentation and reconstruction of the events and dates and places, but not answering the underlying why and how questions, such as why does one become a perpetrator? Or how exactly was the decision made to deport close to half a million Jews from Hungary? 
Another issue that Gianni raised was the lack of international presence among Hungarian historians of the Holocaust, which the editors also point out in the introduction. Um, here I must add that in this respect, there have been several positive developments in the past decade or so, especially in the research of a younger generation of historians and social scientists. For example, the impressive Holocaust in Hungary, The Evolution of a Genocide Volume, which is authored by Zoltan Vagy, Las Lorchus, and Gabor Kada, was published in the prestigious Documenting Life and Destruction series of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in 2013. Several other younger historians, though not necessarily working in Hungary proper, have published important articles and monographs in English or won international scholarships. In 2017, the conference Hungarian Holocaust Victimhood and Memory was held at the EU, where a smaller group of young historians presented the research. Subsequently, a selected number of these studies were published in the historical journal Sazado. The issue under discussion of the Hungarian Historical Review is the next step of the conveners of the 2017 conference and thus fits this trend as it brings together a somewhat larger group of younger historians who use a range of methodologies to bring forward the Jewish experience of the Hungarian Holocaust. In the following part of the introduction of this issue, I will highlight the most important topics and methodologies that the authors of this special issue explore, reflecting on how these connect to trends in international Holocaust research. Though I am now looking at Holocaust research as embedded into the discipline of history, it is a truly interdisciplinary subject which has benefited from contributions of a variety of scholarly fields from literary theory, through sociology, to theology, to psychology, just to name a few. Researching the Holocaust from a gender studies perspective is not new at all in international research, which has long established the fact that Nazism was not, Nazism was not gender blind or gender neutral, and that women experience aspects of the Holocaust differently from men. Persecution affected them differently, and Jews reacted to this perse persecution not only as Jews, but also as women and men. And this is particularly true in Hungary, because of the labor service system called Munkaszolgálat, which was a special feature of the Hungarian Holocaust and fundamentally influenced the experiences of Jewish men and women. The Horthy regime was averse to admit politically unreliable elements such as communists or members of ethnic minorities, and most importantly, Jews into the Hungarian army. Thus, it invented the institution of unarmed military service. Those enlisted performed road and railway construction, for example, but after the Hungarian army entered the Soviet Union, they were assigned much more grueling tasks, such as marching through minefields to, to clear a given area under incredibly precarious conditions. About two thirds of the Jewish men between the ages of 20 and 60 who performed labor service died. Mas Chapodi's contribution to the special issue reflects on these specifically male experiences of labor service when he analyzes the diaries of six forced laborers from Bor, who describe a wide array of experiences ranging from the expression of solidarity among forced laborers to the brutality of some of the camp guards. Meanwhile, women were left at home taking care of the children and the elderly members of the family. Jews living outside the Hungarian capital were deported to Auschwitz in the summer of 1944, where most of them were guests immediately upon arrival. Among these women, the losses amounted to 64% in the age group between uh, 20 and 40, and 83% in the 40 to 60 age group. In Budapest, where Jews were ghettoized, but, not large, but no large-scale deportations took place, about half of the women survived. Endangered as Jews, women also experienced sexual vulnerability. Edith Yegesh describes how the experience of liberation among Jewish women was frequently accompanied by a dread that they would be raped by members of the Red Army. 
Alex and Ramsabo highlights how the Holocaust left a lasting stigma and trauma on female bodies, as many women miscarried or were unable to conceive after the war, either because they were subject to medical experiments in the camp or other uh, physiological conditions, or because of the psychological reasons stemming from PTSD. Helena Buchheim demonstrates how the Irish Margin, Margit Hollander originally associated imprisonment with the traumatic experience of having to appear naked in front of men in the disinfection building. Including these specifically female experiences into Holocaust research can nuance or interpretation of a number of aspects of the Holocaust, from post-war Jewish demography to perceptions of space in the camps and ghettos. Also closely connected to post-war experiences is the topic of liberation, which reoccurs throughout this special issue. Highlighting the Jewish experience shows that contrary to what we might expect, liberation was not necessarily experienced as the return of the much desired freedom. Andras Seychin uses an analysis of the issue of physical space in George Bognar's diary from the Hillerslega DP camp to show how the diarist's experience of liberation was originally dominated by a feeling of bitter criticism of his environment and a feeling of displacement. Gradually, as Bognar discovered his immediate and later more distant environment, he grew fond of the spaces around him. Only then did he finally start to feel liberated. Edith Yegesh demonstrates through her very attentive analysis of interviews with women survivors from East Central Europe that are deposited in the USC Shoah Foundation Visual History Archives that survivors often glossed over liberation in their reminiscences or perceived it as the continuation of persecution. Often, they interpreted it as a process of self-liberation instead of a rapturous moment in time. Indeed, these arguments fit well with recent developments in international Holocaust research, which has by now described a range of experiences connected to liberation and their various implications. For many Jews, liberation did not mean survival. Tens of thousands died soon after liberation, as Andras Seycheni mentions, as a result of overeating, for example, after a prolonged period of starvation, but many others died of exhaustion, malnutrition, or disease. Nor did liberation always signal freedom. Many of those who had survived in labor and death camps were only free to stay where they were, behind, behind barbed wire under allied jurisdiction, just like Jörg Bogma. For others, liberation meant a joyless return home, where they found their families gone and encountered the indifference or even hostility of local populations. For a great many survivors, the end of the war meant the beginning of a long period of migration and displacement. An emphasis on victimhood shows that just like liberation was not necessarily perceived as a specific moment in time, Jewish experiences of persecution and anti-Semitism were not necessarily connected to prominent historical events such as Hitler's ascent to power or Hungary's invasion by Nazi Germany in 1944, or even to such seemingly evident specific spaces as the concentration camp. Helena Huhag demonstrates through a close reading of ego documents and letters that the physical spaces of the Bergen-Belsen camp should not be interpreted as simply tools of oppression, but also as spaces within which the prisoners had some very limited possibility to adapt, and which were thus also parts of the strategies of survival. Other contributors highlight how anti-Semitism was ever present and varied over time only by degree and function. Edith Yegesh's already mentioned analysis of interviews with East Central European women survivors reveals that they often narrate the persecution they suffered during the Holocaust as the direct continuation or intensification of local anti-Semitism. From a completely different material and approach, Istvan Baladam highlights similar phenomena among the ranks of the Professional Association of Budapest Butchers. 
Adam shows how anti-Semitism shaped its professional group's internal dynamics from the early stages of the war, when the growing anti-Semitism of the clientele, coupled with the increasing scarcity of meat, resulted in the ideological sidelining of Jews and leftist colleagues in the name of professionalization. Using documents and testimonies from the post-war denazification process within the ranks of Budapest butchers, the author also shows how, rather paradoxically, this wartime anti-Jewish sentiment was transformed into a just class struggle by communist anti-capitalist propaganda after the war. So could, for example, the robbery of meat from Jewish butchers during the war appear as a form of justifiable class action as Hungary transformed into a communist dictatorship. In her analysis of case studies taken from the materials of the post for government commission for abandoned property, Bella Klatschmann shows not only that anti-Semitic overtones accompanied the post for restitution process of Jewish assets, but also that the whole ordeal that survivors were forced to go through to get a minimal amount of compensation was perceived by some of them as the direct continuation of the wartime confiscation process. The author illustrates the absurdity of the post-war situation with a case when a Jewish agricultural worker requested a cart from the commission so that he could complete the necessary seasonal work in the vineyard. The local representative of the commission in turn assigned him the accessories of a cart rack. Three wheels, two bottoms, one side and bottom built together and one shaft that the requester had to assemble himself. Furthermore, he also had to pay a monthly rental fee for said cart rack parts. The examination of local antisemitism based on sources that offer insight into the victim's perspective is an important contribution to arguably the most prominent and politically loaded question of the Hungarian Holocaust, which is what is the extent of Hungarian responsibility for the deportation and murder of Jewish Hungarians. The investigation of popular anti-Jewish sentiment and its effect on Hungarian Jews on the micro-historical level, of course, does not answer the question about actual decision-making, but it certainly highlights those socioeconomic and ideological processes which provided the immediate context in which such decisions of life and death were taken and executed. Furthermore, such research also helps uncover the reasons why and how anti-Semitism remained a permanent feature among various segments of Hungarian society and the levels of state and economic institutional structure after the war. The topic of responsibility and the role of homegrown anti-Semitism links this issue to ongoing debates in international scholarship as well. In his contribution, Ferenc Lotso deals with the question of why Despite it being a major chapter of the genocide against European Jews, the Holocaust in Hungary did not emerge as a major research topic among German historians who have otherwise been very active in researching the Nazi regime and its working logic. The author argues that German historiography seems to be interested in Hungary only as part of a larger topic, the genesis of the Holocaust and the question of collaboration or cooperation in its implementation. Nevertheless, Lotto points out, German historiography did produce a couple of significant contributions to the historiography of the Holocaust in Hungary. Gerlach and Ali's Letzte Kapital, Realpolitik, Ideologie und der Mord an den Ungarischen Juden, you got to love the German language. Uh, in Hungarian, it, it appeared as az utolsó fejezet, a magyar zsidó legyilkolása, offered a complex, multi-causal explanation for the Holocaust in Hungary, attributing a fundamental importance to the acquisition of the assets of Hungarian Jews for the financing of the Third Reich. This argument was met with considerable criticism among Hungarian historians. Some considered the German author's assessment of the role of Hungarian institutions in this acquisition process understated, while others deemed it inflated 
and emphasize the ultimate German responsibility in the decision making. These positions mirror the two traditional schools of international Holocaust research, so called intentionalist and functionalist approaches which view the role of ideology and pragmatic considerations behind the Holocaust fundamentally differently. Which bring me, brings me to my last point and also connects back to one of the original considerations behind this special issue, the role of the victim's perspective in Holocaust historiography. Many Jews across Europe kept diaries, even under the most impossible circumstances, documented their lives in ghettos and camps. Consider, for example, the famous Ringelblum archives from the Warsaw Ghetto, and were the first ones to record both oral and written testimonies after the war. Jews and Jewish institutions in the immediate post-war period thus spearheaded contemporary documentation project, which produced the material that constitutes the core collections of several substantial archives devoted to the history of, and memory of the Holocaust today. But many authors of this issue use primary sources such as diaries, memoirs, or letters that are in much smaller and internationally less known collections or in private Hungary. This offers an opportunity to challenge, nuance, or decentralize the dominant Holocaust scholarship, which has been based on well-used collections in the West. But most importantly, such endeavors ensure that the incredible amount of documentation amassed by Jewish victims and survivors of the Holocaust is used to ensure that Jews and not the perpetrators tell their story. I would like to thank you very much for your attention and especially for the authors. And I wish that you keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kata, for this very nuanced and uh, attentive reading. I think you gave a very uh, good overview of, uh, of this issue and uh, made uh, also those who didn't have the chance to read it curious. And I think it's also very important to what you, what you did to mention really this transgenerational uh, kind of uh, research production in the last 10 uh, years, because I think with all the crazy political context, it's, there is a very unprobable boom of research. And I think this issue is also uh, representing this, this boom. And also, of course, it's beyond uh, academic research. There is also a kind of thing that uh, I think are important to mention, for example, cinematography and other branches where these issues came up. I mean, not only Son of Soul, but many other things. So I think it's, it's important to put all this into a broader context. And I'm sure Andrea, in her concluding remarks, will also make an effort to, to contextualize this this issue in, in this broader uh, framework. And I think it's also important that this is a generational uh, uh, project as well. I think like the, the contributors to this issue are representing actually, many of them represent a kind of upcoming new voice and 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 group of, uh, of scholars who have their own perspective and own topics. So I will pass the word now to Helena Huhak who uh, represents the Otwish Lorand uh, Research uh, Network, which has a maiden name, I think, uh, Historical Institute of the Academy of Sciences. And, uh, and uh, she will uh, talk about her paper and then we will go to the other contributors as well. So Helena, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Kata, for the kind introduction and a very good and meaningful, uh, meaningful summary as well. Uh, in this paper, I examine a very rare uh, ego documents created by two Hungarian deportees regarding to the Bergen and concentration camp. Uh, one of them is uh, Margit Hollander's diary and Magda Székely's letters to her father, Károly Székely. Uh, the Hollander's diary sheds light on two periods of Bergen Belsen, and the letters offer insight into experiences in two different parts of the camp at the same time. These sources include details about the ev everyday lives, thoughts, perceptions, and feelings of the inmates in the most extreme space of persecution. I argue that focusing on the attachment to place, by which I mean the emotional bond between person and place, an important concept in environmental psychology, 
and seeking after the place of the built and natural environment in testimonies enriches our understanding of the survivor's experiences and uh, led us into a deeper layer of their stories. Uh, Margit Hollander's diary includes uh, five um, handwritten notebooks and almost 40 drawings as well. Her notes based on her emotional rich attitude to the uh, forest in Bergen-Belsen. In her diary, the role of nature is very complex. Uh, nature is connected to her emotional psychological condition. Uh, the diary entries offer accounts of three different experiences regarding the forest, which are related to three different times and different states of mind. She not only saw death and life in the forest, but her parallel feelings were projected onto her surroundings while writing. So imaginations about the forest were not constant. It followed the change of her inner world, her desires, her fears, and uh, her changing attitude to the camp life. Uh, Magda, uh, Magda Seikai letters are also a very rare uh, surviving source. Uh, while there are numerous indications of communications and secret letter writing inside the camp in testimonies. Uh, the letters themselves were not saved. So far I have found only one other example of one single letter that was uh, sent by a Hungarian prisoner inside the camp. In comparison, we have 14 letters in this case. Since Magda had not survived the camp, her father letters were lost. Uh, emotional attachment to the spaces in a, a camp are also a key elements of the Sekai's letters. The separation of the physical spaces of the camp due to the special status of Bergen-Belsen and due to the special sector of the so-called Ungarlager determined the emotional bonds between the father and daughter. Magda Sekai letters show how difficult this separation was for the two people who were related, mainly for the father who know that uh, his daughter was being held under worse conditions on the other side of the camp. This text draw our attention to the emotion field points of the space. Some of the spaces were sites of trauma, but others had positive associations, such as the barbed wire fence where Caro and Magda saw each other. The latter suggests that uh, there could be emotionally positive places in an otherwise uh, negative environment. And to sum up, I think that the comprehensive anal analysis of the Hungarian Jewish camp diaries uh, has so far been lacking for, uh, from the international Holocaust studies. I think these kinds of uh, research project and uh, sources not only at little known and cited uh, text to the international historical discourse, but it would uh, certainly enrich it with new approaches and uh, new aspect too. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Helena. I, I think it, this this was important to add, and and again, this is something that is a very unique material, and I think many people will be very happy to uh, to to engage with what you are talking about, and it also fits into uh, similar international projects of trying to get the subjectivity of of uh, victims uh, from from letters. Uh, I, I'm passing the word now to uh, Paul. Uh, Istvan Adam, who is currently a CU EAS fellow, if I'm not mistaken, and also a, a CU alumnus. Thank you so much. So uh, my name is Istvan Pal Adam, but, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> the main thing is Kota, thank you so much for the introduction. You basically told most of the key points of my study. What I would like to add is just the importance of microhistory. So microhistory, I think, is crucial to to find uh, voices which otherwise uh, for decades remained uh, silent. And I think if we, if we want to uh, refer to, again, what to this uh, 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 Gabor Gianni's comment on the nature of Hungarian Holocaust research, I think this was something which was, was, was missing for a very long time, microhistory and a more, uh, a deeper analysis of how people felt and, and what the everyday people experienced. And uh, it, it was fantastic. I mean, it's really, really meaningful what other researchers were doing uh, for decades. And I, I want to defend in this respect, Gianni, because 
I don't think he he meant that it's not good what other people like. I don't want to tell names, but but those who were just uh, revealing sources after sources in the archive, it, it was not a bad thing. It just we just needed maybe new. Uh, maybe we just needed to add some some more uh, to that and something which which really came from the uh, conversations also from the with, the with the scholars from the international scholarly sort of scholarly field so this is one thing what i'm doing it is microhistory and i'm checking uh, retributional uh, documents uh, and i'm doing this in uh, focusing on one occupational cluster or professional uh, group. Uh, in, the, in this paper, I'm focusing on the butchers, uh, which is really crucial uh, in that respect that anti-Jewish rules combine with the lack of food. So the tensions are really unique in this uh, group of uh, uh, colleagues. And this is also pretty interesting that we can basically, so it's not like what usually the Hungarian, current Hungarian political leaders would say that, okay, all the wrongdoers were the Arrow Cross or the Nazi Germans, but, but we can see that these were actually colleagues, neighbors, and people with whom uh, Jews, the persecuted Jews had uh, everyday or almost everyday contacts. So yeah, maybe this is, this is what I would want to add, but otherwise I can just be, I cannot be glad enough for Kata for summarizing my paper and also for the editors, for the invitation, for the publication. Yeah, this is all maybe, and I'm happy to answer questions if they occur. Thanks a lot, Istvan. And I think indeed this question about paradigm shift in methodology and how uh, different uh, streams of social history and uh, kind of more reflexive uh, streams of social history come into play in this is, is I think an important issue and I hope there will be reflections about this and now I am passing the word to uh, Borbala Klatschman who is at the University of Szeged and also a CU alumna I remember her <laughs> so Bor thank you very much <clears throat> I also would like to say uh, thanks to the editors and also to Kata for uh, this excellent speech. Um, so my paper was about uh, the first phase of uh, restitution in Hungary. And uh, I mainly dealt with the government commission for abandoned property. Um, uh, in the first part of my uh, uh, paper, <clears throat> I was writing about the legal background of uh, the confiscation and the restitution and how this uh, government commission was set up and how it functioned. Uh, which also mirrored the shortcomings of uh, this early phase of restitution. And then I investigated a couple of case studies, which uh, dealt mostly uh, with agricultural assets, such as cattle and uh, uh, carts, which uh, Kata also mentioned. Uh, unfortunately, most of the sources of uh, the government commission were destroyed in 1956, so there is only a handful of documents left. Um, however, uh, from these documents, we can see a great variety of uh, reactions and counter reactions between Jews and non-Jews who were involved in the restitution process. Uh, and in the final part of my uh, paper, I wrote about the attitude of the Jews towards the restitution and the government commission. Um, this is a topic that people don't really know about, I think, and don't even talk about it that much. So it's kind of like a neglected topic in uh, Holocaust research, but not nowadays, but it used to be for a long time. So um, I found it very interesting to see that uh, the Jewish organizations were constantly trying to press the, uh, the Hungarian government to give restitution to the Jews. And uh, they also published numerous articles in Uyelat, which was the biggest Jewish newspaper, um, and mentioned that restitution was not a privilege, <clears throat> but it was uh, supposed to be justice. Um, and of course, as Kata mentioned, uh, they perceived this uh, state that uh, as a continuation of uh, the anti-Semitic uh, process before the Aryanization, and uh, that this was uh, upholding the results of the Aryanization that they did not get restitution. 
um, which is actually also mirrored in the terms that were used in uh, the post-war documents because they used several times the same terms that were used during the confiscation process, uh, just like the term abandoned property itself was uh, uh, used uh, from 1944. And of course, also it must be mentioned that uh, uh, the, um, the government did not apologize to the Jews, so there was no apology at all. And uh, I think this, is, this was more or less in parallel with uh, the failure of early restitution. And uh, there were uh, already a uh, lot of um, arguments about microhistory, which I find very important and very interesting as well, and, and a very good methodological approach. So I'm not going to talk about that. I just want to mention one uh, more thing uh, in connection with my paper. And this is that um, we have these uh, classical, I can say classical uh, terms um, or roles in Holocaust studies like perpetrators, victims, bystanders, etc. cetera. And um, if, if we uh, examine uh, post-war documents, uh, these roles don't exist anymore, of course, uh, because the Jews are liberated. And um, uh, still, we can see that the power relation remained the same. So uh, while during the Holocaust, the Jews were supposed to be you know, inferior in society, they were excluded from society. And when they return, the Holocaust survivors return, the power relations are still the same, even though they get back their uh, emancipated state, they get back their uh, um, um, legal rights. So this is a very interesting thing to note that uh, even though we can't use perpetrator versus victim in uh, post-war documents, the power relation still remains the same because the Jews are basically defenseless against the state and they can't get back their own belongings only in certain cases. So I think this is all what I wanted to add. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Borbel. And, and once again, I think the whole question of post-war, uh, immediate post-war is something that, that has been for a long time missing. And I, I think it's, it's very important to bring this in to the discussion. And uh, now I think we are uh, going to uh, Alexandra Sabo, who is at Brandeis University now, and she was also co-editor of the issue and uh, also uh, studied at CU before she went to the States. I don't know where you are physically now, but... I, I'm, I'm here physically in, in Hungary right now. Uh, I'm stuck in Hungary with the Trump ban of visas, so... Mm -hmm. In, in body, I'm in Hungary, but in brain, I'm I'm in Boston, which is very hard because basically I have to be awake for at least 18 hours of the day. So it's, it's not an easy uh, transition. So thank you very much. Um, I, I want to especially thank Kota for the introduction um, and, and the comments and thank you for your reading and and also, I would like to thank all the all the all the authors. It was great to work with you, and and I'd like to thank Andres, who who we were sometimes even calling each other at midnight <laughs> to to make sure that this issue is born and and um, is is representative of, of of what we want to say. Um, I'm going to first uh, add a little bit of information representing Chopodi Tomash or Tomas Chopodi. Um, just adding a few remarks to Kota's remarks because um, her, her introduction was, was indeed um, very round. The only thing I wanted to add is that I found Tomash's study really important also in terms of his, of his not only the overview of the victim lives and the experiences of labor service in Bor, but also the documents that he represents as primary sources, which, um, which is done by giving basically a physical, even a physical overview of the context and of, of, the, of the diary itself, the fractions, the missing sections, and, and even a sort of 
reading of what other parts of the diaries could have been explored but are missing or are not represented and very interestingly just like Kata mentioned that a lot of primary sources are used here in, or are represented or presented here in in this in this special issue are not published. So um, Chapodi gives us a, an amazing overview of six diaries out of which three are un, unpublished or no, three are not in public collections and only one is published. And um, I think it's just amazing to, to see an introduction of, of new primary sources that could even surface now uh, in, in 2020 or 2021, basically. Um, so that's that's what I wanted to add about Chopodi's paper and about me. So my paper is on the miscarriages of the Holocaust. I titled it as the continuation of um, of the Holoc the corporeal continuation of the Holocaust in women's bodies. Um, meanwhile, I've worked more on the topic. So I'm I'm in the doctorate program at Brandeis University in Boston, and and this is a small section of my dissertation. I will be looking at all fertility experiences, and one of them is miscarriages. Um, just an overview that I would like to share is that the basic um, investigation line that I am interested in is the missing piece of understanding reproductive politics um, regarding the persecuted groups in, in Hungary during and after the war. That's why I, I, I tend to say it's a continuation of the body or, or the corporeal sufferings of, of women. Um, just like uh, Kata mentioned, liberation didn't really mean liberation. And I, I believe that this, this could be um, exemplified through women's bodies um, quite clearly and quite distinctly. But still, um, also, of course, uh, Kata also, also mentioned the, the post-war Jewish demography, how important that is. And that's where I try to look at reproductive politics and how it's a dominant question in the post-war period, especially in the immediate post-war period when it was Jewish women's so-called duty to, to, you know, to, to recuperate the lost souls of the Holocaust. And, and that's a sort of um, social pressure that is even harder than the general social pressure of, of becoming a mother. Um, but what I find interesting and what I would like to, to, to understand in this history that the, the question of, of reproductive politics and how it affects personal lives remains a top-down approach, um, which is interesting because Kat also mentioned there's a not Nazi consciousness of gender and in German and in German research the eugenic studies um, during the Third Reich does look at um, the social history of, of women and um, not only Jewish women, but Roma and Sinti women. And so I would like to apply a similar lens, but looking specifically at Hungarian survivors. Um, so this hopefully um, the, the, the eventual dissertation will prove to be a bottom up understanding of the victim groups. And I'm also looking at Romani, Hungarian Romani women and, and Jewish women and um, other victim groups if I can, if I can find um, their voices. So in order to achieve this, I have to look at fertility events. So this paper is on miscarriages, but I'm also looking at abortions, sterilizations, um, also childbearing in camps and ghettos and in hiding. Um, I think this is quite an untouched topic due to the feminist stance of the 1980s that the women shouldn't be merely understood and examined through their biological um, functions. But I argue that in order to understand the oppressive systems at work before the Second World War, during the Holocaust and in the immediate post-war period, in order to understand these systems at play, we have to look at the perpetrator aspect of the Nazis, of Hungarian um, perpetrators, 
which was reducing women to their biological functions. So, so that's why I wish to, I wish to understand these very specific fertility events and what that meant um, for the women and and also for for um, demography and, and re reproductive politics. Thanks a lot, Alexandra. I think again here the micro and the macro aspects come together in a very, very fascinating way. And uh, I think now uh, I'm passing the word to the other co-editor, Andras Sechenyi, who is from the historical archives of the Hungarian state security. Uh, and, and I think then we will have still uh, some uh, overview of some of the other uh, contributors who are not here before we open the floor for discussion. So Andras, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opening remarks of, uh, of Balash Tencheni and uh, Kostakovich for the kind words and also for the excellent introduction and for all the authors of the papers. As Kostakovich has previously said, this issue had a specific background. I don't want to emphasize it because Kota did it, but uh, I'd like to say something about the editing aspects of I may. Our main goal, or my main goal with this issue as editor was dual. Together studies about the Hungarian Holocaust, which primarily based on the victim perspective, victimhood itself. And that's why the authors use primarily or, man, or many narrative sources, eager documents of the victims, like interviews, letters, diaries, oral and written testimonies as well. I think that the mainstream Hungarian Holocaust research in Hungarian language has mainly been focused on the perpetrators, the perpetrator sources. Uh, not all of them, of course. A good example could be, for example, the Hungarian Historical Review's previous Holocaust thematic issue from 2015, uh, edited by Ferenc Lazo one of our authors. Uh, its title was The Holocaust in Hungarian Context. Okay. Or some books published by CU Press. There are, there are I think, uh, exceptions. On the other hand, in my opinion, there have been mostly descriptive works published in Hungarian language, as Kota Bovish said also. They are based on archival sources and avoid the use of private and narrative sources. It's the basic situation in Hungarian Holocaust research now. This volume's paper, this issue's paper, sources differ from the mainstream Hungarian Holocaust historiography. And this way, we try to connect to the much more wider international discourses rather than to the Hungarians. On the other hand, we also wanted to highlight some topics which have been uh, missing or marginalized from the Hungarian researches so far, that, like the uh, gender aspects, the gender analysis of the Shoah, as, uh, as we heard it. Uh, so this thematic issue contains really new histories from mostly uh, the younger generations of scholars. Uh, well, okay, uh, and now about my paper a little bit. I've been researching the history of those Hungarian and Jewish people who were deported to the Bergen Bats in about 44-45 uh, for a couple of years. Um, I focus on not just those who were deported directly from Hungary by the Kastel group, which is just uh, just a small part uh, of, of the research, but to those inmates who were taken from other killing sites, other other concentration camps, uh, mostly in Janu between January and uh, and March 1945, uh, to Bergen-Belsen. In this case, I try to highlight just one phase and one aspect of the whole story of the Bergen-Belsen of the Hungarian. In, uh, in this paper, I focused on just one member's ego documents, 
So one of the evacuation trains, which was full of hungry Jews and liberated by the Americans in the village, in the village of uh, Parsleben near Magdeburg. Uh, instead of the train could reach its destination, which was the region stuff. After the liberation, the mentally and physically ill and sick survivors housed in the BP camp of Parsleben. Well, uh, it's a kind of a well-known story now. My main question tried to open quite a new respect. Uh, could I, or how could I describe the PP camp based on just one survivor's contemporary legal documents? We found the diary and drone maps of a 16 years old George Bognard, survivor of Belgium. The main part, of my paper is a case study in which I analyze spatial experiences of George Bogner, especially how he perceived the space, the buildings, the areas, routes, playgrounds, and anything else in which he lived in this uh, not too big BP camp, but between, between freedom and concentration camp. Bognard described the camp as a, as a living city. Uh, this camp alone did not play any special role from the perspective of, of, of uh, the Hungarian survivors, of course. On the contrary, it provides evidence of the typical experiences of Jews in Germany in 1945, 46, uh, primarily by using his diary entries and drone maps. I tried to I tried to explore the main markers of the camp, and I compared these sources with the notes. Uh, the notes I took uh, during the visit of, of the site, the former birth of the uh, uh, And the last section I reflected briefly on how the territory and and the space of the former DP camp in Hillersleben uh, changed function after the camp uh, was closed. Uh, that's all I wanted to say about my paper. And uh, I'd like to reflect be briefly, very briefly, on, uh, on uh, Rato Ferenc's paper, which is on the German historiography on the Holocaust in Hungary because this text uh, might be the only one in this volume which has no reflection to the narrative sources of the victims. But the paper is also very important, I think. Uh, I think Lotso's paper offers a good overview of the German language research of the Holocaust in Hungary. As he says, uh, the cooperation between the German and Hungarian scholars is very limited and has always been particularly in, in uh, particularly in institutional level. Uh, there are widely discussed monographs like the Flesco Capital, as Otto Bobos also said it, by Ole and Gerlach, but uh, this is rather an exception. The paper, Lato's paper, shows us why would be necessary connect the joint international discourses in order to develop all of those researchers a European perspective of the national, pers uh, uh, national perspective, which is very common. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Andres. Again, I think the spatial aspect is very crucial in this uh, paper and contribution as well, and also this relationship of micro and macro and the representativity of the, the cases studied, I mean, in a context where there are very few sources, surviving sources. So I think these are all issues that, that are very important and hopefully will be reflected by the discussion. And uh, and I think also indeed what, what you say about Ferry's uh, paper and what Kata also said, I think it's, it's a fascinating question why certain topics and certain national contexts become internationally kind of hyped or internationally relevant and why others are 
are not and i think it's it's also of course it you can easily respond to it that the interface between the hungarian researchers and the german researchers was less uh, successful than the interface between for example polish researchers and and, and german researchers so that uh, the dialogue was less also maybe linguistically less easy and other questions come up as well but it's also i think very very interesting and there are also political and other aspects and probably again this is something that we can talk about uh, later i don't know whether about edit's paper uh, whether alexandra wants to say something or or we uh, go over to the discussion um i i thought kata could you could you um summarize a little bit more at its paper or just if you have additional comments to that uh yeah um i can uh, do that just a second Thank you. um yeah so she um analyzed um as i said these um interviews that are available in one of the biggest resources of oral history of the Holocaust at the U.S. the Shoah Foundation. What is interest, but I found interesting in addition, I, I tried to talk a little bit more about her paper in the introduction because I knew that she was not going to be there. But the one more thing that I wanted to add here is that he was actually the one author who described uh, not strictly speaking Hungarian experiences, but Central Eastern, East Central European experiences. Um, so talking a little bit more about the, the region and trying to pull out these, these very um, unique or um, experiences that, that these women tell about. And it was very telling her paper basically uh, argues that when these interviews were conducted, a lot of them in the, in the 90s, I believe, but correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, that if you look at the questions that the interviewers pose, they reflect a very, a certain interpretation of the period. One of them was that there was this, this very important moment of liberation and that was joy. The uh, other was um, that uh, the ascent of Hitler to power was, was also a kind of a counterpoint, this very important moment. And, but if you look attentively to the answers that these women gave, it shows that this was not so and how they kind of engage with the interviewers trying to kind of refute the questions like the statements that even the questions pose. Um, I think one of the, the examples that I mentioned and, and that will be all, um, that I would like to mention and, and I brought up already was about uh, the Red Army because one of the, it, it's, a, it's an amazing example. I, I really loved it. Uh, I, I think it's great that she found it. Um, the interviewer asks about liberation and there comes the answer, well, it wasn't a moment of joy because we were, we, uh, we were afraid of the, the Russians and we didn't want to meet them or something like that. And then the interviewer asks, why were they looting? And here comes the answer, no, they were raping. Like the interviewer had absolutely no idea why. Uh, what the the interviewee was commenting on, and and this is kind of this problematic that she explores. It's yeah. Yes, I, I think that that was important to add, and uh, that might also be, of course, uh, connected to the question about the transnational visibility of local research and how how this is mediated and can be plugged into international discussions and now I think we have uh, some time I think 15 to 20 minutes uh, for for uh, questions from the audience I I will try to follow the chat uh, and whoever wants to raise anything I think also the uh, contributors can throw in uh, issues to each other but it would be nice if the distinguished uh, audience would also uh, join So maybe while, while the others are thinking, maybe I would, yeah, there is also uh, one question. So I will pose the, that first and then maybe I will also come in with something. So uh, it came from uh, Kathy Pickmans. 
and uh, how come that the collection of Holocaust victimhood does not include any specific attention or chapter or to Romani uh, gypsy victims uh, from Hungary, apart from Alexandra, none of the speakers seem to mention this. So I think you can engage with this, I think, very important question as well. I don't know who wants to join, maybe some of the editor. I guess I'll start then. Um, yeah, so I think my mentioning of, of um, Romani um, or gypsy women is, is easier because I'm looking at a bigger lens. I'm looking at fertility events. So basically the only limitation to my research is age. Um, but if we look at, uh, first I see Ishtan in, 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 in my closest box to mine, he's looking at butchers. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you've, if you've met any uh, Roma butchers in, in your research. So it's, I think it depends on the scope of research for, for everyone. Um, even even my research is is hard to find Hungarian uh, Roma victims talk and of course the question is how many how many victims came back and how many didn't and and um, I always try to remind myself how incomplete this history will always be because the main narrative we have is is mainly survivor narrative and and not of those who. Who, who deceased and never came back. So, but this is, I think, especially problematic for, for um, Romani victims because they, they spoke even less um, after coming back. But what about restitution, um, Bori? Do you, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, actually, I wanted to say something to this question. So, <clears throat> Uh, my doctoral dissertation deals with restitution from 1945 until the 1970s. And I have to say that, well, first of all, I wanted to focus on Jewish survivors, of course, um, but uh, I didn't want to exclude uh, Romani either. Uh, but I have to say that the sources that I investigated, um, basically Romani survivors were invisible. So uh, my first batch of sources came from municipality documents in Pest County, and I could only find letters written by Jews asking back for their properties. And the only phase of compensation where I met uh, Romani victims or survivors, sorry, Romani survivors, that was uh, the compensation from West Germany in the 1960s, 70s. Um, and actually, this can be also connected to your topic, Sandra, because um, these were women mostly who were sterilized in, in, in Nazi camps and in, the, in their compensation claims. Um, well, actually, yeah, my, my focus was on Pest County. And in Pest County, I didn't find any Romani uh, victims uh, of uh, Nazi experiments who handed in compensation claims. Uh, claim, but in, a, in the bigger picture, there were, of course, a couple of uh, uh, Romani uh, victims of uh, Nazi medical experiments as well. So, um, actually, in my case, this is uh, this is the reason why I, I couldn't include any uh, Romani or Gypsy victims because uh, in the first half of uh, this restitution process, uh, I couldn't find any documents about them. Yeah, to to add on to that, I I um I recently read um, Julia von dem Knesebeck's um, uh, Roma struggle for compensation in in post-war Germany, and it's and it's the same in Germany in the immediate post-war period. Um, the problem was that even those uh, Romani survive Romani or Sinti survivors who who returned to to Germany, um, they but it's something similar to what you said about anti-Semitism. It's 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 anti-Roma sentiments, and and they just didn't didn't go to court. They didn't dare go to court. Yes, and uh, 
and like to add something to this question. Uh, we were looking for uh, new studies about the Roma Holocaust when we were preparing the, the conference on, on this issue, but we didn't find any historical historical research on the Roma Holocaust of Hungary or from this aspect. We didn't find it. But I know it's a lack. It's a lack of knowledge and and also a big problem for a Holocaust researcher to find relevant sources, relevant aspects from the Roma Holocaust. Yeah, I think this this was a very pertinent question, and and I think of course, uh, uh, indeed, institutionally there is very very little attention. So I think like it's not by chance that you don't find contributors. At the same time, for example, if I'm thinking about you know the Romanian film Valle of Plungeri, like the Valley of Size, which was actually able to find uh, survivors in 2003. So uh, of course it was also a much more mass event than what uh, the Hungarian story. So I think that they had. Uh, in a way, but they, they, many of the issues that, for example, Alexandra was touching, I touched up on that in that film. So it would be also interesting, maybe, to to kind of at least go into this transnational comparative uh, framing of this issue. And uh, I think now uh, I would like to give the word uh, to to uh, Judy Young. Uh, I mean, she said that she would like to uh, uh, maybe use the opportunity to say uh, something orally and not just to write, but I would like to ask uh, her to be uh, concise because we have still the, the, to give chance to others to ask questions. So the word is yours. I'd like to reflect one of the comments that I made. Uh, the Holocaust Museum in Budapest seems to have an important collection of Roman experiences. Well, I was employed there for more than a decade until 2017. And as far as I know, we didn't have any uh, important collection of Roma Holocaust. So I don't know where this information is from. Maybe this is a new collection of the Roma Holocaust that I don't know. Hmm. I have no information about it. Okay, let's let's uh, move to to Judy's question. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I, I'm very interested in uh, everything that you're doing and uh, this uh, collection of articles that have been published. And I'm very glad that somebody. Well, it was brought to my attention, so I'm very pleased to be here. Um, uh, I uh, a couple of uh, little comments, uh, and and it's great that. This thing is, is coming from younger scholars and uh, different perspectives. And I see that an attempt is being made to kind of um, use perhaps what is, uh, or, or to, to tie Hungarian research on the Holocaust to um, research elsewhere and in other countries. Um, I, I don't know if maybe I missed it, but in, um, uh, I understand, therefore, that this, this volume is much more based on perspective of, as you might call, the victims uh, in that triad or whatever of, of terms. Um, uh, I didn't hear the name of Saul Friedlander mentioned, but I'm quite sure it must be somewhere in, in the volume. I just wanted to mention this because somebody actually, um, I forget, who it was, I think it was Kata in her, in her introduction, uh, talking about uh, the importance of, of that perspective. Um, uh, but, but anyway, and, and that's of course, I think he was one of the first ones who, uh, who wrote about that in, in detail. Um, I, I wanted to know how those of you who I, I have a particular personal interest in the business of the Farsleben or Hillersleben uh, train uh, that ended up, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, it's not Hillersleben, the train that ended up in Farsleben and the passengers ended up in, in a local camp in Hillersleben. Um, because very recently I happened to discover in looking through the list that uh, one of my great uncles apparently must have been on that train. And I say must have been because his name is on the list, but he never arrived back to Hungary. And therefore I have no idea 
what actually happened to him, whether he died already, perhaps on the train from Bergen-Belsen to Farsleben, which some people, that's what happened to a number of people, or whether he died once he was there, perhaps from overeating, who knows. Um, uh, but I was interested in finding out where, uh, and perhaps you mentioned this, but I haven't really read the paper yet, but I saw, I, I, I will now read it with interest. Where was this diary of uh, the person you write about, um, Andras, um, say, uh, what's his name, Bognar? Um, so where, did, where are these materials? Perhaps it was mentioned, but I missed it. So I think that was one of my specific questions, and there may be another, but I don't want to take your time. So if you could just tell me that, or where one can do research, uh, more research about uh, that train or the other trains that left Bergen-Belsen at the end. Thanks a lot, and uh, I don't know who wants to join in uh, answering. I'd like to answer to the question. Uh, well, this, this train, the evacuation trains, are you now the evacuation to the Tadezim and the transport of the Farsleben and the Lerstleben camp inhabitants are a special part of my research. And yes, uh, we, we, Helena and I have been there in 2016 and we visited the area and we try to collect all the materials and sources in connection with Hillersleben and with Parsleben evacuation train. Uh, so it's very crucial for us to, to investigate about not just the story and not just the story of the transport, but about the persons. And uh, uh, we found, we were employed, I was employed at the Holocaust Memorial Center in Budapest, Baver Street. And in the Pava Street Memorial Collections is the place where we found his diary, Bognar's diary. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks a lot, Andras. And anybody else who wants to comment on this? Yeah, if not, yeah, if not then we can, we can see whether there's any other question or comment in the meantime. So write a chat if you have. Yeah, if, if while people are thinking, I mean, what I wanted to ask is still in the spirit of, uh, to a certain extent, uh, Ferry's uh, text, uh, but also uh, about uh, your personal experiences. So how do you see what you are, uh, and I think it's a question to potentially all of the contributors to how do you see what you are doing, to what extent you are in dialogue with international uh, discussions, to what extent there is an interest in what you are doing and to what extent you feel that uh, there is, uh, let's say a similar generational or group uh, 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 kind of identity of other researchers, for example, in the re region with whom you can have some sort of common conversation. So is it a Hungarian conversation, a global conversation, a regional conversation, or a kind of multilateral or bilateral conversation? So where do you locate yourself in, in this discussion when, when we try to look at the transnationalization of this uh, genuinely transnational research topic? So the question is, I mean, they, you publish on Hungary in English, yes? I mean, like it's a it's a English uh, publication. So who is your audience, actually? To whom do you talk to? And do you publish the same text in Hungarian as in English, or do you publish different texts? I mean, like what is the what is the communication frame where you are located? I'll, I'll quickly answer um, first. Um, mine is actually interesting. I don't, I don't think that um, in in the academic sphere, um, Holocaust or gender analysis in Holocaust studies is that is is that open. Um, and and I'm saying this because all the 
all the works that that I've been reading. I mean, Andre is is looking at perpetrator uh, perspective, but the victim perspective seems to be very sensitive still. And and when there's a paper, the first um, I don't know, the first third of the paper is basically a historiographical overview saying, yes, we can talk about gender and specifically women in the Holocaust. So, so for that reason, I guess um, I wouldn't publish my paper in, in this context academically yet for, for, um, for a Hungarian academic audience as I did with this, this paper, but, but I rewrote this um, experience perspective of miscarriages of, of um, victims and survivors, but not only survivors. And um, Sombat, for example, published it in, in the form of article to at least have, you know, a public discourse uh, initiative of, of talking about, about fertility events that, that occurred during persecution, which is a very unique set of experience. Um, so I'm very happy to see that, that there is an opening to, to, to this topic of mine. Maybe, maybe if I can add to that, that due to the political situation of Hungary, I think there is a there is a certain interest, especially if it comes to to the memory of Holocaust, and uh, but but in other aspects as well. So you can I think easily publish in English or other languages. I personally publish less in Hungarian. Uh, and I did also my PhD abroad, so I am less connected to the Hungarian academia, but this is why I was ex especially glad for this possibility. But uh, so, so I think current uh, political situation uh, extends a little bit of the interest the political interest into the historical research interest as well, if I can say. If I may add uh, something to what Istvan said, um, there, uh, when I was writing the introduction, I, I had to take it out because I thought it was too long, but I wanted to mention that there is a similar kind of um, younger generation of historians in Poland uh, that are doing similar things. Uh, I'm thinking um, of, uh, for example, Katarzyna Persson, who are who are working on the Ringel Bloom archives and and um, translating, transcribing, looking at um, different versions of diaries. Um, so I think Hungarian historians are not alone in this. There's uh, also actually Czech Republic is another another location where this research is Slovakia as well. So so I think there there is um, in Central Eastern Europe this this movement, and I agree with Ishvan that perhaps it is not not coincidence that Hungary and Poland are both kind of uh, very strong in it. Um, so uh, yes, and. Um, one more short thing, I'm kind of an outsider a little bit because my, my research is on Holocaust memory under communism and not the Holocaust itself. But that topic actually is now very hot, very sexy as we tend to say. Um, there, is, there is a big international uh, interest because there is a paradigm change in this area and, and it's really, it's, it's not hard to, to publish internationally. Yeah, of course, I mean, this raises a further issue that I think many of us are encountering, like this kind of uh, separation of the local production and the international production, yes, that like something that in other countries like Romania was quite visible already in the 1990s, but in Hungary there was this illusion that there is a relatively strong connection between, let's say, internationally visible and competitive historical production and locally visible historical production. And I think your generation probably is actually the generation where this really departs. So people, some people are producing for international audience and sexy or not sexy topics, but they are producing for, for a global audience, but they barely publish 
in, in, in Hungarian, and then there is a Hungarian local production, which very often is basically for politicized uh, local consumption, and it has not much to do with international methodological standards and and be it, be it let's say benevolent or malevolent uh, narratives, but but um, very often malevolent, of course. But but then these two uh, discourses don't communicate anymore with each other, and this is two different words, actually. So I, I think this also probably is a food for thought uh, for for us all. I, I don't see any other uh, comment, so I think I will give the word to Andrea Petter, who was uh, very much behind this project as well, and and uh, and I hope that she will have some reflections about what we have been discussing so far. And and I, I also think that this is this was a very important way to to think through these things. And I hope that this is not the one only opportunity to do this, but you will reconfigure your team. Uh, in future ventures as well, and there will be opportunity to do similar events uh, in the future as well. Andrea, the word is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Balaj. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity and uh, thank you very much for uh, hosting and co-hosting this uh, uh, event. And I just would like to you know, radiate some hope and positivity uh, because when we started to you know, collect uh, in this uh, digital space, you know, everybody was tired, sad, depressed, you know, we were complaining about the snowstorm and whatever. So I just would like to, you know, in these dark times, uh, use this opportunity to celebrate this special issue and congratulate, first of all, the uh, editors whose uh, um, uh, activity and whose work have been extremely valuable. I would also would like to celebrate the collaboration of different institutions, uh, the Department of Gender Studies and also the uh, Department of History and the Past Incorporated, and first of all, the uh, uh, the uh, Subcommittee of History of the Second World War of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, which already, you know, signals that this is a, uh, an important topic, and uh, in Hungary there are spaces. And the, the next point I would like to celebrate is uh, Central European University, which went through this uh, very difficult period of uh, uh, moving from one uh, European Union country to another one. And um, uh, it, this event uh, and the special issue demonstrates this new generation of scholars who actually uh, uh, nearly all of them are uh, CEU alumni. Uh, alumni. So the, uh, this is a new beginning for in different types of uh, uh, scholarships. And uh, uh, when the CEU moved to Vienna, there was a kind of despair in Hungary and there was this term coined, this so-called left behind academics, what will happen to them. And I think this event also demonstrated that uh, uh, there will be lots of interesting events and future activities, uh, no matter that CEU actually the award, uh, the award that was Sigmund Freud, the degree um, uh, awarding programs actually left uh, uh, for Vienna as a political exile. So, uh, I think this uh, special issue is extremely important, uh, and uh, some, some of these uh, points have been already mentioned, so let's just uh, be, be, uh, put these some points together. This is, uh, the first is that the article is actually contributing to uh, two major debates which are, uh, uh, have been discussed uh, in Hungary, uh, and the, the first debate is about the chronology. Uh, I mean, this sounds pretty simple, but the first debate about the history of the Holocaust in Hungary is about the chronology. So when did the persecution of Jews in Hungary start? Did the numerus clausus uh, or with the anti-Jewish legislation in 1938, the German occupation, and actually when did it end? In 1945 with the anti-fascist narratives or in 1948, as the revisionist rhetoric claims since between 1945 and 48, the communist Hungary state persecuted Jews together with other religious communities, or we heard um, from uh, Borbala Kochman with the uh, uh, extremely flawed uh, uh, process of, uh, of compensation. So this, this is one debate. And uh, I think that these um, uh, uh, articles contribute to that. The other is about the responsibility of the, of the Hungarian state. And I also believe that uh, this uh, 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 
uh, articles, which are mostly focusing on the case studies and micro histories, uh, brought in very interesting and new perspective. And we should not forget what Balaj already mentioned that this special issue was made in Hungary by the uh, uh, former Institute of uh, History's journal, the Hungarian Historical Review. And uh, the aim was to make visible the scholarship about uh, uh, Hungary and also uh, written by uh, scholars from here. And the audience is, of course, the question who will be reading this particular uh, scholarship. And uh, uh, this, I, I'm actually convinced, and that uh, is a kudos for the editors, that the innovative theoretical framework of these uh, uh, articles will be uh, picked up by the international uh, scholarship and they will be integrated uh, into the different um, uh, uh, st strands of research. And uh, so this is the good, you know, that was the praise, but uh, we also have to point out that uh, it is the CEU which uh, uh, was hosting the first uh, conference, uh, um, which uh, actually produced the uh, this co first collection of uh, articles, which was published in the Sazad of the Hungarian um, uh, Journal of, of History. Uh, and and um, that reflects on the poor institutionalization of uh, Hungarian Holocaust research. And it was Gabor Gianni who pointed out first in this uh, often quoted uh, uh, article. And this kind of poor institutionalization surprises international scholars, uh, because this is not the case in the Czech Republic, not the case in, uh, in Slovakia, not the case in Poland. So this kind of uh, mismatch uh, uh, between the uh, lots of talented uh, internationally uh, publishing uh, young scholars, uh, the importance of the of the topic and the lack of institutionalization. I think this is a special, unique uh, situation, and that's why I would like to praise the scholars who actually contributed to this uh, special issue and also the special issue in Hungarian for Sazado for their. Uh, endurance and uh, uh, that they are working among precarious uh, circumstances and still producing fantastic uh, research. And uh, lastly, I would like to uh, underline that there is a new phenomenon which needs to be uh, discussed, which we thought we have been passed in 1989, and that is the self-censorship of uh, historians. But this is coming back because of the uh, illiberal uh, states, uh, the memory politics of the illiberal uh, state. And uh, uh, I would like to praise and use this opportunity again to praise those scholars who actually, for the Hungarian, for the um, uh, Sazadok, for the uh, prestigious Hungarian historical journal, uh, when they were, when we were uh, putting together this, uh, the, the version of this, uh, uh, collection of articles in Hungarian, and there was a, a kind of intervention and the censorship uh, intervention. They, uh, no matter that they have got precarious working conditions, they uh, unanonymously un supported uh, the uh, uh, academic uh, freedom and the integrity of research. So I just would like to uh, underline that. Uh, that uh, in among precarious uh, circumstances, one can still opt for a kind of uh, brave uh, solution. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, also raises the point that uh, self-censorship has become a kind of constitutive part of the Hungarian historiography now, which will have long lasting uh, consequences. But um, standing up against self-censorship and uh, uh, kind of uh, against all odds and all possible material uh, problems, uh, uh, this special issue and hopefully some others follow uh, actually produced uh, fantastic scholarship. And now this is uh, uh, an open question how the international community will actually uh, accept and will react to this uh, special issue. And I hope that it won't be uh, silenced, ignored, but it would be appreciated, used, and quoted. And thank you very much again for this work, which I think is really important and pioneering in so many ways. Thank you. 
Thanks a lot, Andrea. And, and indeed, I think once again, these issues that you are raising are, are, will remain with us. I think this is not just about this particular event, but, but I think this is something that, that we have to reflect about. And I, I think also about the weight and, and, uh, and resonance of the research that you are doing. I think all of you are, uh, has, has very many implications and, and I think also ethical and also political and cultural implications. And, and I think it's very important to, to reflect on all this. And, uh, and I would like to say thanks to, to all of you who were uh, here, also to the audience, some of them black uh, uh, faces or no faces at all, but, but we trust that they have been following with great attention this discussion. And also just one additional uh, mention that uh, at least Democracy Institute of CU is something that is uh, staying. Yes, it's a leg left in Hungary uh, in in this kind of very, very uh, mad situation. So we hope that uh, this uh, institutional frame will also create opportunities for scholars in Hungary and intellectuals in Hungary to kind of connect uh, to the international networks and also the international scholars to kind of connect to young Hungarian and, and altogether Hungarian researchers and kind of keep up uh, some sort of normality in this very, in many ways, abnormal situation. So once again, thanks to all of you who were attending and let's hope that this is, uh, this is just a beginning of similar events and also let's hope that the next similar event will be live and not just a uh, Zoom meeting. So thanks again and try uh, to keep safe and see you soon.